Bienvenidos y muchas gracias por acompañarnos hoy. Welcome and thank you for being with us. I am Maria Camila. I am coordinator for this event. First, I would like to talk a little bit. We would like to have a few instructions. We have simultaneous interpretation in Japanese, English, Portuguese, and in Spanish. On the lower right hand corner, you'll have a globe icon. There you can select your language of preference. Select the language that you prefer. We have interpretation in English, in Portuguese, in Spanish, and in Japanese. So you can choose um, the language that you would prefer. In la primera parte del taller, so during the first part of our workshop, we have two presentations given by Japan. We will start with Yvonne Koi, who is a uh, consultant working in international cooperation in Japan. And then we will have a presentation by uh, Sendai. We will have a brief presentation, a video, and we will look at three in cities in the region. We will have Manizales from Colombia, Concepcion in Chile. And if the emergency in Central America, if it allows us, we will also have a scheduled presentation covering Tegucigalpa, Honduras, but we will see. Right now they are going through the emergency with the uh, storm. After that, we will have time for uh, questions from the participants, a Q&A session. Uh, during this webinar, Bosai building resilient cities beyond disasters, you will have an opportunity to learn from the experiences of Japanese cities in the region as to how they've responded to earthquakes, tsunamis and um, flooding, and how their policies can improve the efforts undertaken by these communities. So this is the result of a joint effort between the bank and the uh, authorities in Japan, and we have worked with the objective of looking at uh, Latin America, the Caribbean, and Japan in developing resilient and smart cities. We will have our first discussion to covering this to increase cooperation among cities and address these challenges, both in Japanese cities as well as in Latin American and Caribbean cities. I would now like to offer a welcome to Director Shigel Shimizu, who is the director representing Japan, Korea, and we also have uh, Slovenia, the UK, who will welcome us with a few introductory comments. Go ahead, Director. Hola. Uh, muy buenas tardes. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen and good morning to our participants in Japan. I am Shigeo Shimizu, and I am the executive director for Japan at the Inter-American Development Bank. It, it's an honor to get to know all of you during this event. Resilient cities. Japan has experienced many disasters, in, including earthquakes, tsunamis, floods, as well as volcanic eruptions. Every time these devastating events have taken place, we have felt uh, enormous sacrifices, economic as well as uh, social sacrifices. However, these experiences have made us more resilient in the face of disasters. We have also learned how to respect and live with nature. Currently, 
many people in Central America are now suffering the effects of Hurricane Ita and preparing for other disasters. So professionals and uh, experts in ma disaster management are working day and night in order to address the threats generated by these disasters. They work with total dedication to manage these uh, disasters in their daily efforts. When, when I was uh, director in uh, Japan for multilateral organizations, the city of Sendai in October in 2012, at um, meetings with the IMF and the World Bank and Japan, we looked at mainstreaming the management of these uh, disasters. And I am very pleased to see that we have seen an expansion in cooperation between Sendai and the multilateral banks. We are fully committed to assist countries that are exposed and vulnerable to natural disasters. We hope that this event will help to generate a better understanding as well as working in cooperation between Latin America, the Caribbean and Japan. Thank you. Thank you, Director Shimizu. Before we move on to our next panelist this, more, this afternoon, this is someone who works in the Department of Latin America and the Caribbean, a um, very um, significant partner in this event. I would like to now thank Director Rahoshi Tangen. Go ahead, sir. Distinguidos participantes, espectadores de este webinar, muy Distinguished buenas... participants at this webinar, good afternoon. It is an honor for me to welcome all of you to the um, Bosa and Beyond seminar. I am Taisitanga and I am director for South America in the Department of Latin America and uh, Caribbean at, the, at headquarters, working uh, with the IDB, I would like to first express my most profound expressions of solidarity to our friends in Central America who have been impacted by Hurricane Eta. And hopefully that we will soon come out of this crisis and we hope that your families and friends are safe. We know that Japan suffered the same typhoons and uh, storms. The combination of COVID-19 and these natural disasters created a very complicated scenario show, that showed that we were not completely prepared. Japan and Latin America and the Caribbean may be separated by physical distances. And um, because of the time difference, I um, had to record my video. I would like to have addressed you live, but we have much in common when we talk about natural disasters. We live in the same ring of fire. We share the Pacific Basin. We share the same destiny. And I think it's natural that we need to ex share experiences and knowledge as to what we do in addressing disasters and how can we mitigate and also build better prepared cities. Japan is an island nation whose size is 385,000 square square kilometers with 120 million inhabitants. The urbanization rate is 92% and half the population is lives in three mega cities. There were 1,025 mudslides in 1990 when we had 5,400 uh, cases in 2018 and 2019. Now we believe that there's 70% of possibility that Tokyo might be affected by a mega earthquake in the next 30 years. So with all the sacrifice and suffering, Japan has a wealth of experience in terms of disaster mitigation, and it gives a great deal of priority to disaster prevention. The Japanese government encapsulated successfully the infrastructure and quality the quality um, measures 
at the uh, G20 meeting in uh, Osaka, Japan last year. The principles are referred mainly to resilience. In that context, JICA has already been undertaking technical cooperation and financial cooperation initiatives to generate capacities and infrastructure for natural disaster prevention, promoting the reduction of risks to disasters under the name of BOSAI, which means the same in Japanese. Before I conclude, I'd like to thank the IDB for being a great partner to the Japanese government uh, represented by the Ministry of Finance, who has always supported us generously through the special trust fund. I should also, I can't mention everyone, but I should mention and thank uh, Director Shimizu, our executive director at the IDB, and uh, Mr. Nakamura, representative of the IDB in uh, Asia. So thanks to my colleague Miro Chitani, who worked uh, with Camila San and Kamuna Sai. So hopefully today's webinar will be another source of inspiration and opportunity for a mutual learning experience among all of our participants. Thank you very much. Thank you. And so after these words of introduction, I would now like to introduce Chesu Cambra, our specialist in risk assessment at the IDB. Thank you very much for being with us and go ahead. Thank you, Camila, for this opportunity. And I'd like to extend uh, special greetings to our audience in Asia. Good afternoon to our audience in the Americas and good evening because I'm sure we will have some participants in this very important topic in Europe and in Africa. So I think today we have at least four, maybe five uh, renowned panelists and hopefully we'll be able to get the representative from the city of Tegucigalpa, Honduras, as you've already been mentioning. We have four panelists, top uh, experts who are going to share their own experiences in terms of uh, urban uh, risk management in the face of disasters and resilience. We also have people who represent the city of Manizales and Concepcion. Manizales is in Colombia, Concepcion is in Chile. We hope uh, we'll see if we have representatives from Central America. And I would also like to uh, join in the comments expressing uh, our most, uh, all the, our best wishes for Tegucigalpa, for Honduras and Central America in general. Hopefully they will be able to overcome this very um, difficult and challenging uh, disaster that they've been facing. So with our first presenter, we have Mr. Sinichi Fukasawa, who is manager of the Department of Urban Development of the Nippon Koe Consultant uh, Group. This is a consultant group that is uh, has a great deal of experience. They have participated in more than 3,000 infrastructure projects throughout the world with a significant presence, not just in Asia, but in Latin America. And today, our speaker is going to share experiences that they had by way of the implementation of a very interesting uh, initiative in several Asian cities using uh, diagnostic tools related to some of the key lines of effort in the uh, Sendai framework. Just as a reminder, they strengthen governance, risk management, they invest in resilience and they to try to strengthen preparation so that they can better respond to disasters. Go ahead, Mr. Fukasawa. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Shinichi Hukasawa of the Urban Development Department of Nippon Koei. Thank you for having me today. From 2015 and 18, I had the opportunity to participate in a JICA program called Building Resilient Cities in Asia and in ASEAN. Today, I'd like to talk mainly about the overview of the program and its outcome and challenges. 
Today, I'd like to talk about these seven items listed here from number zero to six. First of all, allow me to introduce my company, Nihon Nippon Kobe Group. We are the largest engineering consulting firm in Japan in terms of size and sales. Our firm was established in 1946, and for over 70 years, our firm has deployed businesses in about 160 countries. Our business scope, uh, which I'm talking about today, is not limited to Southeast Asia and are also active in South and Central America where you live. For example, we have disaster prevention projects uh, in Honduras and Brazil. Additionally, in Latin America, we have an affiliated firm called Nippon Koe LLC based in Panama which implements projects in Brazil, Peru, and other areas in Latin America. Here I listed the websites of Nippon Koei and Nippon Koei LAC. I hope that you will take a look at both of them. We also have put together a brochure titled Geohazard Management, which is also available in Spanish, so I hope you can review it as well. Now moving on to the main topic of the day. First of all, I'll speak about ASEAN. ASEAN stands for Association of Southeast Asian Nations, just as is described here. As far as the location goes, ASEAN is located south of China, east of India, and north of Australia. From where you live in Latin America, it depends on which country you live, but the distance from ASEAN uh, is about 100, sorry, excuse me, 15,000 to 20,000 kilometer away. From Japan, the distance is about 2,500 kilometers from the closest, which is Philippines, and about 6,000 kilometers, which is the, from the farthest, which is Indonesia. ASEAN is comprised of 10 nations, namely Brunei, uh, Dar Jerusalem, Cambodia, Indonesia, Laos, Malaysia, Myanmar, Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, and Vietnam. This slide shows the basic information, which are land area, size, total population, population density, nominal GDP, and GDP per capita. As far as the land size, population, and population density go, we have also compared with the information of CELAC, Committee of Latin America and Caribbean States. If you look at the numbers, you can see that in terms of the land area size, CELAC is about four to five times larger. Uh, while population-wise, uh, ASEAN has slightly larger number, and as far as the population density goes, ASEAN shows a number that is about four times larger, which shows that ASEAN is much more densely populated. This next is the outline of the project. Just to go over the background, ASEAN nation, similar to where you live, are faced with high disaster risk. And the major disasters that took place are the 2004 Indian Ocean earthquake and tsunami, which affected the region, particularly Indonesia and Malaysia. In 2011, Thailand experienced a large scale flooding which led to flooding in industrial complexes and ultimately left a significant damage to the supply chain in Asia. In other words, the disasters that took place not only took people's lives, but also left a huge damage to the economy. As far as uh, the ASEAN's efforts in face of these disasters, after the Indian Ocean earthquake and tsunami, ASEAN Com Committee on Disaster Management, ACDM in short, was established. This committee is comprised of the disaster management, management ministers of the member nations. This committee formulated 21 concept notes of AADMER work program two action plan between 2010 and 2015, which included resilient city building in ASEAN nations. And as you can see here, uh, the objective of the JICA program is to develop the implementation framework for the concept of building resilient cities in ASEAN. 
There are three outputs of this project, which I will introduce you in the following slides. But what is highlighted here in blue shows the new output as we made progress uh, in this uh, project. This is where, as you can see, the blue highlighted portion. And here is the management structure of the project. ASEAN on the left and JICA on the right. Here you see the ACDM, which is a committee of ministers. And under the which is the ACDM working group on prevention and mitigation, which was our main counterpart. And then here we have ASEAN Secretariat, which facilitates ASEAN nations and AHA Center, which manages ASEAN disaster prevention data. We also created a steering committee at JICA to run the project. Next, I'd like to talk about phase one. As you can see here, we have phase one and phase two. Phase two refers to what was highlighted in blue, which is added on later, as I explained in one of the previous slides. The output one refers uh, to the establishment of our regional network. As you can see here, we held ASEAN forums, workshops, develop website, and open a Facebook page. The workshops were quite important here, in which ASEAN member nations gathered to discuss and provide input as far as specific activities to implement towards output one, two, and three. And then we use the, the insight that was collected in order to determine our specific projects to implement. This slide shows the output two, which refers to city selection for a demonstration project. First, we looked at around 2,400 municipalities in ASEAN countries, and then decided to extract about 800 municipalities that have more urban characteristics. And then uh, we conducted the first uh, disaster risk assessment in which simple uh, methodologies were used for from a macro uh, perspective by making use of uh, open data sources. This is really a preliminary um, a kind of risk assessment. Then the list was narrowed down to 56 cities to which we implemented the second preliminary risk assessment. This phase was more detailed than the first one by assessing the vulnerability, exposure, and other data. Then we narrowed further down to 16 shortlisted cities. Then through discussion, each member country made a recommendation to select the final eight candidate cities. The reason why the total number of the cities were eight instead of 10 is because the number of member nations, uh, excuse me, uh, instead of 10, which is a number of member nations, is because Brunei and Singapore were taken off the list due to their low risk assessment. Then finally, it was determined in the middle of the selection process to conduct demonstration projects. So two cities were selected out of the eight. They were selected based on the level of contribution and commitment. And then there are two cities uh, selected. One was Denpasar in Indonesia, and the other uh, was Luang Prabang of Laos. This slide shows the output three, which refers to the development of tools. The ASEAN guidebook was developed for the urban planning and disaster prevention government officials. The guidebook particularly focused on making disaster risk reduction, uh, this concept of this reduction notion as a mainstream concept in terms of urban planning. And as an appendix to this guidebook, we prepared a checklist for the local municipalities. There were two, two of them. One was for disaster risk reduction and the other was for city planning. This slide is showing the disaster risk reduction checklist showing four items aligned with the priority activities listed in the Sendai disaster prevention framework. There are about 120 check items for each list. This slide shows the visuals of the checklists. The lists are made in an Excel format. 
And here the user can evaluate each item in five levels between zero and four. The next step is here where radar chart is created to visually show the strengths and weaknesses when analyzed from the perspectives of the priority activities contained in the, uh, in the Sendai framework. And here, the, the third step is where low scored activities will be listed and generated. And the boxes on the right here will first be empty. So the municipalities will have to fill out the blanks to determine which item has low, medium, or high priorities by grading A, B, or C. Then the action item list will then be generated for each priority. And as you can see, uh, we have created very convenient checklists. Next, I'd like to talk about the newly added demonstration project. This slide shows the outline of the demonstration project. Sorry. The project sites were Denpasar in Indonesia and Luang Prabang of Laos, and the project lasted for about seven months. The main objective was to implement the four priority actions of the Sendai framework and to build capacity among the municipality administrators for building resilience in their cities. As far as the main activities go, data and information collection and also preliminary disaster risk assessment, these are the things that took place. Additionally, a checklist were created and scores were given. Then the scores were re reflected in making the action plans. There are two types of action plans. One was an action plan to produce disaster risk reduction plan. And uh, the other was an action plan to make land use plan. This slide shows the output of the action plan for land use plan in Denpasar. This table shows action items for each priority activity and the assigned institutions, as well as the period of time uh, for uh, the implementation. Lastly, I will talk about the outcomes and challenges. Uh, this is the outcomes. These are the outcomes. So what is colored in blue here shows the outcome for the output one. one. And the green here, shaded boxes, show the outcome of output two. And then the pink boxes show the outcome of output three. The yellow boxes here show the outcome of demonstration projects. So here are what we created as the project proceeded. This slide uh, shows the challenges that we faced. And in our project, various products were developed for outcome one, two, and three, but how the municipalities will make use of these products will be important in the future. It really would be the key. And another challenge will be to disseminate the experience and insights earned through the projects. As far as, uh, as part of disaster risk reduction effort, what is particularly important is really to promote investment before any disaster takes place. So the challenge is in raising such awareness. Additionally, we have focused not only on the disaster prevention management aspects, but also on city planning aspect to reflect in our project. So the key in the future is to have the players in each sector to cooperate with each other. In regards to the resources, we included the website of our project products. So I hope you will access if you're interested. Lastly, JICA has also put together a website regarding our activities on disaster risk reduction. It contains extremely useful information. So I hope you will visit. Nexus. That is all. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Very well. Thank you so much, Mr. Kasawa.
for this presentation. This uh, tool for diagnosis and planning that's aligned with the four priority actions within the Sendai framework. I think there's an affinity and alignment between this tool and the scorecard that was developed by the UN and which is being adopted by more and more cities of the world as a diagnostic tool and a tool for planning as well so they can fulfill the objectives established within that international agreement in the Sendai framework which um, goes until 2030. Now I'll give the floor to Mr. Yuki Takahashi and this is a beautiful name of the place where Mr. Takahashi works. He is the manager of the Promotion Office for the Environmentally Friendly City Promotion Office of Sendai. I think it really conveys the spirit of the work that they are doing from the city of Sendai. And this started with the huge catastrophe that befell Japan in 2011. Mr. Takahashi will tell us about the lessons they learned during and after the earthquake and the tsunami that hit Japan and the city of Sendai in particular, and how these lessons have been included in the planning of in public investment projects, in particular, in terms of critical infrastructure. Go ahead, please, Mr. Takahashi. Just a comment while we wait for the presentation to start. Now for the interpretation, you will be able to listen to the Spanish through the Spanish button. Previously, it was coming out through the Japanese button. Now to listen to Spanish, you will press the... My name is Takahashi of Sendai City. I'd like to explain to you our activities related to disaster resilient and environmentally friendly city planning. First of all, allow me to provide you the overview of the damage caused by the Great Eastern Japan earthquake disaster. On March 11, 2011, an earthquake at the size of magnitude 9.0 hit us, and along with the subsequent tsunami, which is thought to be a kind that only occurs once in a thousand years, robbed almost 20,000 lives and destroyed over 120,000 buildings across Japan. Next is a damage caused to Sendai City. There are mainly two areas of damages in our city. First is the eastern coastal region that was hit by the tsunami, and the other was the inland region where landslide occurred. Sendai City lost almost a thousand lives, and over 30,000 buildings were completely destroyed. In terms of monetary amount, the total damage to the city was over 1 trillion yen, which is about 9.5 US uh, billion US dollars. Next, regarding infrastructure recovery, the sewage system was not affected, but it took one week for the electricity, two weeks for the water services, and about a month for the gas services to recover. Now, regarding the evacuation centers, during the peak time, approximately 100,000 people, which accounts for a tenth of the population of Sendai, needed to take shelter. Now, the lessons learned. I will show you the public facilities located in the coastal area. One is called Minami Gamo Waste Water Treatment Plant, and the other is a gas plant. There was also damage to the urban area as well. As I mentioned earlier, much of the infrastructure was disrupted and due to all the public transportation services being suspended, many people in the city struggled to return back home. Additionally, due to the damage to the distribution facilities, people experienced shortage, shortage of fuel and food supply. This is what we learned from experiencing infrastructure damage. Simply put, being prepared during regular times will help minimize the damage and lead to a quick recovery. 
I can give you one good example, which is seen at the Minami Gamo Waste Water Treatment. While the facility received devastating damage due to the tsunami, it quickly put together a recovery policy just six months after the disaster. Just to provide you the general overview, they put together a plan under the assumption that tsunami will occur once again in the future. So they raised the foundation of the facility and constructed tsunami resistant walls, which can withstand the 2011 level tsunami. Additionally, as part of an effort for environmental improvement, solar power generator, as well as small scale hydroelectric power generation facility were built. This was a manifestation of the willingness not to limit the efforts to mere recovery, but also to bring upon improvement as well. Next, I'll talk about debris disposal, Sendai model. After any disaster, typically a large amount of debris is generated and must be removed. In our case, we needed to deal with the debris equivalent to what we normally would have have over seven years. However, thanks to the preparation and planning that took place beforehand, 70% of the debris was recycled and the entire debris removal, removal process was completed in just two years and nine months. Next is about how the citizen participation in evacuation site management. Generally speaking, the larger the disaster damages, the more limited the scope gets for any government bodies. Therefore, we review the local disaster prevention planning with the perspective of sharing and transferring authorities. We also established new evacuation center management system in which individual departments of the local government had an assigned region maintaining communication with the local residents during, during normal times in order to be ready in times of emergency. There are three areas of measures for commuters in times of disaster. The first is to secure temporary shelters, which is done in cooperation with different companies. The idea is to allow commuters to remain in the city after disaster, and we're recommending local businesses will always store provisions. Additionally, we have cooperative relations with local convenience stores to support commuters who decide to walk back home. Again, the lesson learned is that preparation during normal times lead to quick recovery and reconstruction. Next is about disaster resilient environmental friendly city planning that Sendai City is promoting. What is promoted here is a kind of city planning focusing on environment lush with greenery and is disaster resilient and we aim to establish the imagery as part of our city branding. There are three major steps we're taking, namely city planning, human capacity building, and passing down the experience and lessons learned to the next generation. What gave this idea a big boost was the 2015 UN World Conference on Disaster Risk Reduction held in Sendai. There, the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction was adopted. Additionally, a public forum was held in Sendai in which, in which over 400 events were held and over 150,000 people participated and its activities were broadcasted widely. In the Sendai framework, improved recovery effort and variety of disaster prevention measures were included, which had the same general direction as what were included in the Sendai reconstruction plan. Our hope was to make use of the momentum caused by the UN conference, where the idea of disaster resilient environmentally friendly city planning came about. Therefore, successive measures have been launched vigorously aiming towards establishing our own unique strengths. To give you some examples in terms of city planning, solar panel power generation system was installed at designated evacuation sites. During normal times, the system contributes to CO2 reduction and the storage batteries provide energy in times of disasters. Measures towards tsunami are also another example. There are mainly three areas of tsunami measures. First is a multiple defense system in which levees were built in the coastal regions to guard against tsunami. In preparation for large-scale tsunamis, we have raised the level of ro roads in order to reduce the impact of tsunamis. We have also secured evacuation routes and built evacuation facilities so that re residents can evacuate as soon as a large-scale disaster hits. Furthermore, for the housings built in the area that are deemed too risky, we're uh, re de determined to relocate further away from the coastline. These are the comprehensive measures that we have been taking against tsunami risks. This is, there's not much else that can be done from an infrastructure point of view in order to lessen the damage from disasters. 
That is why we also engage, are engaged in improving human capabilities as we hold local disaster prevention trainings. Another uh, area of efforts are in passing down our experiences and lessons learned, which is quite an important area. We have been describing our efforts in various publications and inter introducing our efforts to various international conferences around the world. In other words, we have been broadcasting our experiences and lessons learned to the world and to the future. We have also accepted many visitors to pass down the lessons that we have learned. At Tohoku University, we held the World Bosai Forum, where we introduced our efforts. We have also been holding many events for the citizens, where we return insights and lessons back to the citizens. We will soon <coughs> mark the 10th anniversary from the great disaster. With more and more children have no knowledge about it, so our disaster prevention efforts will only gain more significance in the future. People tend to view the notion of disaster prevention as being a rather serious and rigid one, but we have launched more events that are more interactive and more visual aids are used. We would like more young people and families with children to learn about disaster prevention through these types of events. In summary, through the efforts of city planning, human capacity building, passing down experiences and lessons learned, Sendai City aims to create a city that is comfortable and resilient against disaster. We want to protect lives, livelihoods, and the economies for all. We also will shift from mere recovery and reconstruction mode towards creating a city that is disaster resilient and is environmentally friendly. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Takahashi. Honestly, I've enjoyed your presentation immensely because you've been able to explain the complexity of risk in cities. It's not a trivial matter. It requires a holistic approach as you've expl explained with the participation of many different professionals with different experiences, different backgrounds. And another aspect that I wanted to highlight from your presentation is the importance of understanding the limits of disaster risk mitigation and the importance of complementing mitigation with preparedness actions for that residual risk that cannot be mitigated. Now I'd like to leap across the Pacific and go to Colombia where I'll have the pleasure of introducing Alexa Morales, director of the risk management unit of the beautiful city of Manizales. I will promote the city a bit if I may. If you love green areas, I assure you that in Manizales and its surroundings, you can find all the shades of green that exist on the planet. I think it's a fantastic and beautiful area. Manizales is located in an area with very complex geography. And in addition to that beauty, there's also the presence of all kinds of natural landslides, but the authorities and the population of Manizales because of this have been pioneers on numerous occasions in implementing different measures and solutions for dealing with, successfully dealing with this disaster risk. So I'd like to give the floor now to Ms. Morales and she'll tell us a little bit about the complex geography of the city and its surroundings and its history of uh, disasters and destructive events, but also she will be sharing with us some of those pioneering activities that Manizales has uh, achieved over the last few years. I think this will be interesting to our audience. Go ahead, please. Good afternoon, everyone. 
I want to thank Sergio for that kind introduction. I hope the next time you visit Manizales, you'll visit me as well. I, we extend very warm greetings to all of you from Manizales. I am Alexa Morales. I'm the director of the risk management unit, as Sergio was saying. I think many of you are a bit familiar with our city. This is a photo that I took from my place of work. And we see the mountainous geography of Manizales. And there's also a great diversity. And coffee is grown in this area, the coffee that many of you might drink in different parts of the world. But fortunately, we are also a resilient city. Manizales has developed upon a very uh, interesting topography. We have a volcanic soil, a high level of precipitation, it rains also seismic activity due to how close we are to a volcano. We are near the and this mountain chain, and we have a volcano there. And for decades, the city has worked on preparedness for these events because of all the experiences we've had. And these experiences have taught us to become resilient and to anticipate different events and to develop different strategies for preparedness for disasters. Our city is familiar with disasters, as we were saying. We faced a number of situations throughout our history since the city was founded. We've had fires. We've had seismic events, volcanic eruptions, and landslides. In Manizales, in the year 2003, a day of uh, heavy rainfall caused landslides, 18 deaths, unfortunately, and a lot of damages to different families. And you can imagine how a single rainfall event can affect so many and so much. Many might remember us from 1985, a volcano erupted and two departments were affected. We lost approximately 20,000 human lives and incalculable uh, material losses. Next slide, please. Fortunately for Manizales, risk management has been focused on by different actors, public and private institutions. We're working with the administration where we've done some technical and scientific work along with academia. We have our national university, the University of Manizales working with us. The University of Caldas, the Catholic University and the Autonomous University have also joined us for some projects and we've laid the foundation for a lot of the developments that we've seen in the city. The Manizales Foundation also wanted to deal with the fires. They created a special firefighter team and also entities such as Civil Defense and the Red Cross uh, joined this group. So was reactivated and started that we, uh, with that, we started a volcano, volcano observatory. This volcano is now one of the most monitored in the world. Risk management in Manizales is based on public policies and practices at the national level where knowledge is being consolidated, risk reduction, also emergency management and risk transfer. I, hear, I have here just a couple of examples of what we've been working on and what we've done in the city. 
one of our achievements was including risk in our land use plans, but the first plan for Manizales uh, was completed in 2001, and already we had made significant progress compared to the 80s, where risk had already been incorporated into land planning based on land use rules. So we were able to anticipate this type of measure. And today we have a very specific and rich plan. It's been modified through the years. But regarding risk, we have maps that include all kinds of information, geomorphological, morphometric, erosional uh, processes, all kinds of data of this kind. And these have been integrated together through the geographic information system, which is uh, open to the public and has specific applications used for uh, different types of control. We have these measures and then together with the National University, we've worked on meteorological stations. Manizales has 14 such stations looking at environmental variables, in particular precipitation. The university provides bulletins on a frequent basis where we can see uh, rain, rainfall and we can calculate an index, a 25 day index. And this is compared to a predefined standard so we can be aware when there's a danger of landslides. And together with the National University, we've also coordinated with the early alert system for flooding in the various uh, streams in the city. Another achievement together with the scientific community was seismic microzoning. This was a detailed evaluation of geological information, morphological features, uh, seismic features in the area. And this allowed us to have a microzoning seismic map of the region. And this had a great impact because we were able to specify requirements and recommendations for the design and construction or for the design of new construction in Manizales, I meant to say. Another achievement of ours is the transformation that Manizales has undergone. We've had increasing instability that began in the 70s. And these events increased due to urbanization processes. And for that reason, measures were taken regarding risk mitigation projects, as well as stability uh, management for uh, water. And this started in 1973. We have over a thousand projects for water level stability. Uh, we've also looked at our vulnerability and uh, we included our vital structures, places such as the hospital, the uh, seat of the government, firefighter stations, uh, seismic vulnerability studies were conducted and today they have been reinforced. So they will be prepared for this type of event. Together with protection, we've created a community program, the Guardians of the Hillside, we call it. And this is a program that empowers women who are heads of their household so they could uh, take care of the hillsides and uh, provide maintenance. This is a very interesting program that brought together different universities from the city as well as various public and private institutions. So here you see the women they trained in communication, leadership skills, community participation, and they also were given some technological basics regarding how these projects 
operate and so they could recognize signs of instability. And finally, I was asked to discuss today So I will talk about that a little bit now. And that's what I was referring to when I talked about risk transfer, transferencia del riesgo. This was a program that we had in Manizales. And I say we had it because unfortunately it ended last year. However, we are in the process of reviving something like this. This is a collective insurance plan that protects the insured against any uh, losses and damages from fires, earthquakes, landslides, avalanches. But what's key about this and the benefit it provides is that once people are insured, once we had about 40% of the buildings insured, then lower income families would be included. So they would be covered in case of a disaster of this type. And the program we've had since 1989. And here you see uh, an invoice of the local tax where the person agreed voluntarily to provide an extra payment for this insurance. And on a lot of uh, our real estate, there were some subsidies that were provided by the owners of one uh, building or structure in order to subsidize the rest. And this was based on technical and scientific studies. It was very uh, intense work, probable uh, maximum losses were calculated and this and the microzoning of seismic threats contributed greatly to this. Manizales has a lot more to tell you about all the actions we've been taking for many years. I hope we'll have other opportunities to tell you more about what we're doing and we're always happy to answer any questions if you'd like to know a little bit more. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alexa, for this uh, excellent presentation. You've touched upon numerous aspects related to comprehensive disaster management. You've talked about the role of risk analysis in order to prioritize for planning, for investing in mitigation projects, but also you've talked about the importance of that risk analysis in order to properly prioritize financial protection strategies. Another main topic that I think will contribute to the sustainability of your work is that strategic partnership you have with the universities, with academia. It was very interesting. In the question and answer section, I'm sure we will be seeing much interest in uh, discussing some of these in greater detail. Now, we will stay in the Americas. We'll go south to Chile, one of the most vulnerable countries of the region when it comes to earthquakes. In particular, I hope I'm not wrong, but I think Chile has the record of having had the strongest earthquake in history. Perhaps our presenter, Sergio Beris, will can confirm that. He is the president of the National Council of Urban Development, and he will be sharing with us the experiences and lessons learned based on the earthquake and tsunami that hit Chile in 2011. Go ahead, Sergio, please. Uh, thank you very much and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very pleased 
to be able to share with you an experience, both personal and professional, that I had to address. This was February 27th, 2010, with the earthquake that shook the country, followed by the tsunami, which generated enormous um, devastating damage in the uh, southern part of Chile. Chile is a very long country line, and obviously it is located in a region of the world that is uh, ever changing and uh, very dynamic. It has 2,600 active volcanoes. The country has is faced with constant um, results of uh, earthquake activity. Just to give you an example, between the time that I prepared this report and 2020, this year, we've seen four earthquakes in Chile. Three of them were eight or beyond on the Richter scale. Now, we should also remember that the largest earthquake, the most devastating earthquake, was in Valdivia, Chile, about 400 kilometers to the south of Concepcion, which was a 9.5 in terms of magnitude on the Richter scale. So we've also had two major uh, floods with uh, tsunamis, also two major volcanic eruptions. And then, of course, the southern part of the region of um, Chile, known for its forestry area. It's an area that uh, has been affected by many changes in nature. And in 2010, we had an experience after a, a fairly long, quiet period, we had a very complex uh, situation arise in the case. And just let me relate this I want to talk about the Bio Bio River uh, region, where I was tasked with rebuilding 14 coastal communities that were impacted by the earthquake at 8.8 .8 on the Richter scale, as I mentioned. And subsequently, after the uh, addressing the needs of these communities, they then were faced with a tsunami these 18 communities, as well as others in the south central part of Chile, where you had Concepcion from the uh, down from the epicenter. These, some of them small communities, others uh, larger, they had some statistics that perhaps um, are not really uh, that relevant for but the images, I think, speak uh, louder than any statistics. This is before and after the tsunami. You can see the level of uh, devastation that the tsunami generated. So this event from 2010 that I'm going to focus my comments on was uh, relatively, although it's, it, it, you could see that uh, a lot of the uh, earthquake proof buildings were able to um, withstand there were devastating human losses but uh, many of the earthquake proof buildings were able to withstand that those shocks what was an unexpected of course was the tsunami the tsunami doesn't just destroy buildings like an earthquake it destroys cities and communities and it it gives a different uh, emphasis on our strategies for disaster mitigation and response. So as a result, the structure that we looked at was to see how can we rebuild cities in these coastal areas? And we developed a strategy based on these four pillars. Resilience, resilience, that doesn't just mean rebuilding the way things were before. We need to rebuild perhaps a couple of steps beyond in terms of quality so that um, we can mitigate 
at least to improve the situation uh, if we were to face another crisis or disaster. Also having greater citizen engagement, promoting sustainability in the rebuilding effort. And we also looked at improving the um, quality of life of our citizens in urban settings in particular, and to also focus on improving economic development and activities because an earthquake doesn't just destroy buildings, it destroys cities and it destroys the social structure, economic structure, and it degrades the uh, living standards of its victims. So the challenge looked at this. And let me just summarize this very uh, complex plan and explain what's most important in the rebuilding process for us that we're constantly called upon to address is to establish the engagement and interaction of all of the stakeholders involved, identify them, identify their respective functions and responsibilities and incorporate them into one single objective. One of the key challenges is not the lack of resources. The greatest problem is the number of actors and stakeholders who want to address this problem from their own perspectives instead of looking at it from a comprehensive, holistic perspective, from the perspective of the plan. So these master plans, we developed 18 of them, where we establish together with the community and uh, within the geographic localities in urban, these urban communities, we looked at the resources available and the possibility of generating these standards of uh, building standards so that people could return to live here. Not just because we said they have to live here because people wanted to stay and live in these areas. So it was a dual challenge. It was a, twice as difficult and resilience was a determining factor where we can't reduce risk factors to zero, but at least we can improve the response capabilities after an event like this. So each one of these developed into 18 community rebuilding programs and they're very sectoral. Each stakeholder, universities, ministries, the public and private sectors looked at this on the basis of one concept and, and in the, the, the issue I'm going to raise right now in, with regards to the locality, we concluded that the only solution for these communities could continue remaining here was to build coastal um, barriers and defenses. Looking at it through a modeling uh, example where we could see exactly the uh, hydrodynamics and we looked at uh, the mitigation area that we would put along the line here along the coastline these mitigation uh, barriers so in addition to uh, channeling the um, the waterway to improve the rapid uh, flow of water and also strengthening evacuation routes so that we wanted to upgrade and update all these uh, evacuation routes. And these were also pointing to safe places as well as establishing um, resilient dwellings in addition to uh, those we also looked at the emergency management as well as safe places, including firehouses and uh, schools. So as you can see with the rebuilding here, here we continue with the uh, um, mitigation uh, focus where we are consolidating this. We're putting up uh, dwelling, dwellings that are resilient this doesn't mean that they may not be impacted in case of flooding, but at least they can re be, be rebuilt because these people are not going to leave their jobs, their livelihoods, their fishermen. And we also have these dwellings that uh, have similar characteristics and safeguards. So this was very... Uh, carefully evaluated and from the perspective 
uh, the execution of public works. And you can see it here in this chart where we have the various uh, topics that deal with uh, rebuilding and reconstruction. But in the area of healthcare, in the area of uh, cultural, as well as environmental factors, we realize that the rebuilding process is not just a, a question of building resilient cities. You also had to include other factors and other areas, looking at the ecological damage, looking at the processes before, during, and after. Just to remind everyone and to conclude that uh, the greatest asset that we have in terms of resilience is our people. And Chile, after the tsunami and the earthquake, we had to rebuild 60,000 dwellings. And uh, this was all done through volunteer efforts. As you can see, these young people here that contributed to building and rebuilding dwellings, 60,000 of them in four months. So the real asset that a society or any city has or community is to, again, build that social capital amongst its community and citizens. And here we see it manifest in our rebuilding of greater resilient communities. And uh, I wanna thank you very much. Thank you, Sergio, really interesting presentation. And I really enjoyed the message about uh, taking a disaster as also a source of opportunities, of generating opportunities, and that um, rebuild, uh, reestablishing these physical assets, but it's also an opportunity to uh, rebuild, regain the both the social and economic uh, fa fabric as well. So now let's move on to a, the Q&A session for our speakers. So we are now looking at a series of questions from the audience. And as we're starting to receive comments and questions, I would like to just start by asking you a question. I'd like to ask a question to the Nippon Koi representative, Mr. Fukasawa. This is based on your experience. What surprises have you had with the investment and infrastructure programs and mitigation efforts in Latin America and in other regions from around the world? So I really wanted to ask engineer or Mr. Fukasawa, if you have some examples based on your experiences in your company, have you had any solutions based on uh, support, ec ecological and, uh, re and reinforcing nature? And what advantages and disadvantages have you had based on nature when you compare that with uh, the traditional infrastructure measures? Thank you. Now I would like to answer the first question. Previously, nature-based solution was not so common, so uh, we were not able to collect much examples in the ASEAN studies. That being said, we have been considering ideas similar to the nature-based solution. For example, uh, uh, for a wetland-like area that is frequently flooded, we consider that as a high-risk area in which construction of residential buildings should be avoided. Additionally, the guidebook that I introduced in my Output 3 presentation earlier shows our flood control basin area, idea, excuse me. This is basically an idea uh, where uh, an area that is used as a park or athletic field under normal circumstances, but when flooding occurs, this area functioned as a basin to temporarily store flooded water from a nearby river. There are other ideas like this that our project uh, shares. 
Next, I'd like to talk about the advantages and disadvantages of nature-based solution based on what I know. I'll give you three each. I'll start with the advantages. First is the ability to harmonize with the nature. And second is the fact that you can use the functionality of nature to art advantage, such as force ability to store rainwater and to control landslide. Thirdly is the ability to make cities nature filled and comfortable. Such cities are visually appealing and it also provides tranquility. Now, let me talk about the three disadvantages. Firstly, it is hard to quantify the effects of nature-based solution. That is what we think. For example, it is hard to quantify the safety level from external forces, or it is hard to conduct cost-benefit analysis. Secondly, is the need to develop technologies in order to adopt, adapt to the unique characteristics of each local area. I believe it is challenging to gain insight about the local ecosystem. Thirdly, the amount of work that goes into maintaining and managing this type of solution is quite a lot. You see, there are many types of vegetation and living creatures to manage, which can be quite a burdensome task. That being said, I am still learning myself, and I will continue to learn as I participate in the future resiliency projects. I would also like to hear from you regarding your own experience in the Latin American region as well. That will be great. That concludes my remark. Thank you for your kind attention. Yes, without a doubt. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Bokasawa. Now we have a question for Mr. Takahashi from the municipality of Sendai. And this is the following. Does the Sendai municipality have any um, insurance to protect uh, their physical, uh, very similar to what was explained in the case of Manizales? Or have you um, had, do you have any sort of emergency fund? And how do you distribute the emergency fund if you do have it? And does this fund is it able to, over time, accrue resources? Thank you. Now, we did have property insurance for buildings and others. However, after the 2011 disaster, we received a grant from the central government. With that, we created a fund from which we withdrew funds gradually to use for recovery and reconstruction efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Takahashi. Now I would like to ask Alexa Morales. You mentioned in your presentation about the long process that the municip municipal government has had in disaster risk management. You've conducted long, uh, risk studies dating back sometimes to the 1970s, others dating back to the 1990s. And you have discussed many examples of activities amongst the principal components related to risk management. So then the question is, what have you done in order to incorporate in the municipal policy risk management factor in their, their priorities. Because when you hear about the various measures undertaken by the municipal government, this obviously is a priority for the municipal authorities. So what needs to be done in order to convince the authorities about the significance of dealing with these issues? Is it a question of, well, since natural disasters in that area, in that jurisdiction, they're so uh, constant that the local authorities have no choice but to make it a priority in their agenda. Or maybe that uh, they, they've been, you've been able to successfully uh, convey and press the significance of these 
challenges to the municipal uh, authority. So what really is the magic solution for this to be a part of uh, government uh, pol the government policy agenda, especially governments that have limited assets and resources? Well, just an answer to that question, the it really, it's, it's a recurring question. First of all, we must say that that risk dynamic really compels and requires all of us to assign priority to risk management. It's very important to highlight that there's always a political will behind that, especially when we look at the natural disasters that Manizales has faced. But I should also point out that universities, various uh, entities have always been a part of the effort. We have built, as I indicated earlier, risk management efforts in Manizales with uh, various and diverse institutions, not only working with the municipal authorities, the municipal government, we have also worked with resources from uh, diverse institutions. Other measures were created, for example, by the environmental um, office that has generated uh, resources for stabilization measures. We've also had partnerships. We have had um, inter-organization uh, partnerships with universities, for example, that constantly support us in uh, diverse projects, working on early warning systems, working with greater community outreach and engagement. So I would say that it really is a combined effort. It's an effort that requires interaction from many institutions. And because of the situation in Manizales, because of the number of uh, events that we've had to face in that city, we are always closely uh, trying to um, follow up events. We have technical, scientific, economic um, institutions that are also putting their effort forward. That's why I think Manizales has been so successful. We've seen so many efforts that have been developed uh, focused on uh, preventive measures and uh, protecting the lives of the citizens of Manizales. Thank you very much, Alexa. Now I have a question for Sergio. We saw that in your presentation, amongst the various aspects that were taken into account in the recovery plan after the earthquake hit and the tsunami, you were also looking at governance priorities. So could you just explain that concept a little further from a municipal perspective? What is it that the municipal authorities, how do they interpret when they when you talk about uh, governance and uh, in terms of managing this risk and the governance structure how is it manifest is it manifest through regulatory framework is it through a new um, infrastructure measures when we're talking about reinforcing governance after an event like the tsunami and earthquake of 2010 well basically the focus that governance has in Chile, in my opinion, and I think overall, is a critical one because we live in a country where we have highly centralized governance institutions where the, the lowest link in that chain pertains to municipal governments, but the municipal governments have very limited resources. So what we see is we're seeing a major change in April of next year for the first time. We're going to be electing regional governors who are intermediate level authorities. They were going to be elected. And for the first time, we're creating a new regional governance structure that um, will, I think, work together with the local governance structures. Now, from a risk perspective, what, what we have seen is the reinforcing of uh, the land uh, management and uh, reinforcement measures. What we're seeing is equipment, critical equipment in vulnerable regions as well 
as measures that are associated with discouraging living in uh, areas that are considered highly vulnerable and even dangerous. So governance in terms of land management is in the hands of your municipal governments and yet the rebuilding efforts are much more complex and require a much more hierarchical structure, a vertical structure, in other words. It's almost like a fire where you have to have somebody in charge of the firefighting efforts. And if we look at the rebuilding efforts after the 2010 earthquake, the process was more regional and decentralized. In the Bio, Bio region, we saw the creation of a technical team tasked with coordinating all of the public sector stakeholders. And it also engaged with various municipal governments in order to find solutions to the various uh, proposals. And in, in the proposals that they wanted to implement, in some cases, approval processes that required significant and complex changes, urban changes, but in terms of uh, risk management, it's the municipal governments that are now involved in uh, land management. Now, in some municipal governments, they have their own agent agencies, trainings in Chile. There is a centralized entity that carries out evacuation exercises, simulations in order to provide that awareness and provide training opportunities. The same thing in schools and other institutions at the both the local and centralized level. So I think in both, at both levels, it is necessary. And of course, the third level would be at the national, but now we're reinforcing the regional efforts. So it's not, it's not just a municipal or simply regional or simply federal level. It's got to include all three. Thank you very much for your response, Sergio. And now we go on to another question. This is for Mr. Fukasawa from Nippon Koi. And it has to do with the risk analyses that you have carried out in uh, several Asian cities. So my question is, when you conduct an analysis and you look at those elements for calculating the risk, you quantify in that inventory, you quantify only physical assets or do you also take into account the economic flows that are also exposed to impacts as a result of these natural disasters? Now, I'd like to provide my answer to the second question. In the ASEAN project that I just presented to you earlier, I talked about the output two in which candidate cities were selected for the demonstration project. There are also two kinds of preliminary risk assessment that were conducted during the selection process. In the first risk assessment, we looked at the population as well as a number of airports and seaports, um, namely the infrastructure and their distances from the city in question. We also looked into the availability of any industrial complexes and the distance from the city in question. We used them as indices in order to assess the impact of the supply chain in their region. In our second risk assessment, based on the need to add more economic data, we added GRDP, that stands for Gross Regional Domestic Product Data. During the demonstration project itself, the detailed attributes of the buildings were assessed. For example, uh, the building materials or the height of the buildings themselves. Uh, and uh, while we were hoping to uh, also assess the property values of the infrastructure, land, and the buildings. Unfortunately, we were not able to obtain uh, the relevant data. Uh, Indonesia is said to have a more advanced data management system in place compared to other ASEAN nations, but still the municipality we dealt with was not able to provide the necessary data. 
I believe many other ASEAN region municipalities need improvement in their data management systems. Earlier in my presentation, I mentioned the checklist under the output three. In the Sendai Disaster Prevention Framework, one of the priority activities is to understand the risks. Therefore, we added in the checklist an item to confirm whether the municipality has data showing the attributes and property values of their, inf in their uh, infrastructure and buildings. Our belief is that it is quite essential for the municipalities uh, to have sufficient capabilities as well as funding available uh, to obtain and manage pertinent data in order to understand their risks in a detailed manner. This concludes my answer to your question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Fukasawa. We now have a question for Mr. Takahashi from uh, Sendai Municipality. When a disaster has happened, how Far, to what extent is it the responsibility of the fiscal authorities of Sendai? And to what extent does the departmental and central government have the responsibility? Should they finance reconstruction only or also economic reactivation as we have understood it to be the case in Concepcion, Chile? Thank you. Much of the recovery efforts have been supported by the grant provided by the central government. Additionally, salary reduction was applied to the city government employees. Furthermore, many from within and outside of Japan sent us donation. I'd like to express our gratitude here. As far as the reconstruction effort, agricultural land was restored and economic revitalization plans have been implemented. A water treatment facility called Minami Gamo facility is a successful example of our reconstruction effort. We also review the local disaster prevention plan as well as our disaster prevention education plans, which are the non-infrastructure type activities that have been successful. Thank you very much, Ms. Takahashi. We have received quite a number of questions about financial protection and referring to the experience in Manizales. So I'll try to condense them all into a single question. Does the city of Manasales have a comprehensive financial protection strategy that includes insurance and also possibly uh, risk retention uh, tools, emergency funds, or other financing sources for contingency situations? And in terms of insurance, which Alexa mentioned in her presentation, was this policy put out through a private insurance company. Thank you very much for your interest in the ma matter of insurance. Manizales uh, takes care of the risk through various sources of funding, through private or uh, through its own resources from the mayor's office. There's also a municipal fund for risk management, and it is funded through decentralized entities of the municipality with a maximum contribution of 1% of the annual budget of each one of the entities. So through this municipal fund, we can work on uh, gaining knowledge, reduction of risk, prevention, and really, Resources are never enough. When we're talking about risk management, we know that a lot of work needs to be done and that those are efforts that we bring about with the support of other organizations, as I mentioned earlier. 
regarding collective insurance. Yes, the insurance policy is paid for through the tax payments. These are real estate taxes. And uh, this extra amount that is paid is given to a company that has a direct relationship to the insured. And this was the entity that took care of the entire process and made sure that these insurance policies were paid for. In 2017, the last case, we had a few landslides in the city. And uh, that's when we started receiving a lot of payments for going to those who were insured in particular at that time due to landslides. I'm not sure if I was clear in my answer or if we, you'd like me to compliment. Yes, thank you, Alexa. That was a very clear answer. We have a lot of questions for Sergio as well since he has shared with us Chile's experience. Just a couple of questions now. The first one, what was the main source of economic funding for the recovery of those eight cities you mentioned in your presentation? And another question, this one is coming from Ecuador and greetings to the asker of the question, Hugo Yepes. How did you break out of that paradigm that exists in our region? It says that tsunami uh, vulnerable areas should not be inhabited at all. Thank you very much for the questions. The first one uh, regarding funding, uh, we use public funding for this. Chile allocated $10 billion approximately for the rebuilding process. And it does need to be said that Chile is a country that early on had a policy that was quite liberal from the economic perspective. So a lot of our public urban infrastructure has been given to private companies as a concession and they in turn take out insurance policies for ca catastrophic events. So public funds were mostly focused on the rebuilding of housing, but a lot of the public infrastructure was able to leverage funds from those insurance policies of uh, the, the ones who had the concessions to take out insurance policies. We have bridges, ports, airports, and others that are under concessions to private companies. In the case of housing, it was all public funds. Our own funds that the country had saved after a boom that they've had, they'd had after the uh, copper or the, the copper boom made it possible to save this amount of money. And it is necessary to have emergency funds and we need to be prudent and cognizant of the fact that uh, we will go through complex cycles. But the question is interesting because I think that paradigm has not been broken yet in terms of not living in tsunami vulnerable areas. One of the more complicated processes was getting people to understand that living in a safer place could also improve their quality of life. However, communities in a coastal country such as hours and being close to their coastal activities. This is something that is part of their culture. And uh, perhaps they're more daring uh, than uh, we would think. They are conditioned to expect certain cyclical events, but then they enjoy in the meantime. So for us, it was impossible to change their minds. It seemed uh, irresponsible ethically and morally so all the 
housing reconstruction projects that we did were done in safe areas, people voluntarily moved there or in risk areas where certain mitigation measures had to be implemented. I mentioned some examples, the coastal defenses and others. And this shows that the level of danger of the, the, the risk of tsunamis and the danger could be reduced and uh, reconstruction could be possible if we had these measures in place. But there's no lesson that's harsh enough to break apart this paradigm where people occupy these risk areas. And it's part of our nature as a country because there are very few places that are secure. We have seismic fault or we have uh, tsunami prone areas or we have landslide prone areas or we have volcanoes. We also have uh, enormous forest fires. So really there are very few areas in Chile where we are completely free of risk. So we have to take on that culture of risk and we have to promote resilience as the only way to truly improve people's uh, survival capabilities. I don't know if I have uh, fully responded to the question. I've made an effort and it was a great question. Thank you very much, Sergio. I think I was told that at 4.42, we had to conclude the Q&A. So it is exactly 4.42. It's been extremely interesting. I want to thank our four wonderful panelists for your presentations and for answering the questions. If you ask questions and uh, we were not able to get to them in this brief period of time, we will try to email you an answer to your question. Once again, thank you everyone for your interest. I'll now give the floor to Tatiana Gallego. She is uh, in charge of, uh, she's a division chief of the housing and urban development section at the IDB. And she will provide some concluding remarks. Thank you very much, Sergio. I want to thank our four world-class panelists. And Sergio mentioned it when we began the session. Thank you for sharing your experiences and your first-hand knowledge in your respective countries and cities. In closing and in terms of conclusions, I don't know if we have any slides to show. There it is. I'm sorry, it looks a bit small, but in any case, I'd like to highlight the following topics. Mr. Fukasawa gave us an opportunity to really get to know some of the diagnostic and planning tools that were generated in the context of ASEAN. In particular, with regards to the uh, regional disaster framework and uh, the also for increasing resilience for cities. And this was done in coordination with JICA. And I have a, a few ideas that I'll take with me, but this is an initiative that has mobilized several countries and cities. There were actually two cities that were the ones where this methodology was tested, but this aspiration to work together jointly as a region was essential. Personally, I went through the tsunami that affected the area of the Indian Ocean at the end of 2004. And I think regional initiatives are increasingly important after that experience. And I think training exercises and action plans at a local level have also been a true learning process for this initiative. And this has given way to a lot of thought to what investments are necessary 
in order to prepare cities for disasters. We also had a chance to have a conversation with the representatives from Sendai. And I'll take a few messages with me. First of all, Sendai has defined a vision that brings together disaster management and at the same time, environmental improvement as a comprehensive and combined objective. Also, another topic I found very interesting was the idea of complementary and redundant infrastructure. Sometimes we see that as a way to proceed in extreme situations or at times when additional infrastructure is necessary for a quick recovery. Third, we had with us Alexa Morales from the city of Manizales. And there they've made uh, all kinds of different efforts in terms of responses to volcanoes, earthquakes, landslides, all these events require coordinated action. And I will particularly remember what she said about collaborative work with universities and how key that has been, not only in terms of knowledge, but also in terms of finding management tools and also in including the aspect of risk in planning exercises and in land use plans. And also the fact that mitigate or risk mitigation and stabilization projects have been uh, implemented. This means that this is an integral part of what you do and communities participate in these programs and also in training programs. Also from Manizales, I liked the idea for insurance that is collective and that is linked to a real estate tax. And I think this idea can be very interesting for many of our cities. And uh, finally, uh, we have the work uh, that has been done in Concepcion, Chile, and how they have dealt with tsunamis and how this has been critical in terms of defining principles for rebuilding for those families that do not want to move away from the coast because their livelihood and their lives are there by the sea. And also the fact that urban reconstruction along the coastline needs to take into account sustainability, resilience, a platform for the future and an improvement of quality of life. Also, that the fact that reconstruction has to take place in a secure and safe way, but the identity of the local population needs to be maintained. And then jointly and in a participatory way, they will design and rebuild homes and infrastructure. Finally, I wanted to highlight, as Sergio mentioned, the idea that the disaster, even though it's devastating. It is also a, an, a, an opportunity generator. And if it is managed properly, it can allow us to recover the social and economic fabric that we had originally. With that, I'd like to thank all of you for being with us today. And I will now give the floor to Keisuke. Bueno, muy buenas tardes. Good afternoon to our friends in Latin America and the Caribbean. Good morning here in Japan. I'd like to express my deepest gratitude to the panelists and the participants. And last but not least, to my IDB colleagues, Maria Camila, Tatiana, and Sergio for organizing this very interesting and important event. We have a saying in Japan 
natural disasters happen when we forget. The presentations we've heard today enrich our knowledge about risk management in terms of the natural disasters, both sides, but also they increase our awareness so that we can be better prepared. And finally, I'd like to express our solidarity to those who have been affected by Hurricane Eta and Hurricane Iota in Colombia and Central America. I hope that you will recover very soon. Thank you very much. Go ahead, please, Maria Camila. Thank you very much everyone this has been a very interesting and enriching conversation a lot of lessons learned have been shared we also have lessons yet to learn we'll be sharing all of them with our participants and finally before we say goodbye i'd like to invite you to our next webinar from the series on uh, economic reactivation in cities where we talk about how local governments can uh, enhance that recovery work through the housing sector. On November 24th, we invite you to be with us. We'll be sending out invitations. Thank you very much. Good morning to you in Japan and good afternoon in Latin America and the Caribbean. Thank you very much. <laughs>